Thank you. Please be seated. All right, who's covering this arraignment on behalf of the state today? I will be, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. And Mr. Archibald, you are for the defense, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. This is the time scheduled for an arraignment. This is case CR 22211624, State versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Archibald and Mr. Thomas represent the defendant. Mr. Archibald, how does your client prefer that I refer to her through this hearing? Mrs. Daybell. Very well, Mrs. Daybell is represented by John Thomas and Jim Archibald for this hearing today and have been appointed on the case. The state is represented by Lindsay Blake and Tanya Rawlings also here for the prosecution. In this case, uh, Mrs. Daybell, my name is Judge Boyce. I'm the district judge presiding over this case in Fremont County, and I've been assigned to preside over the case throughout its duration. In a few minutes, I will arraign you on the criminal charges that have been filed against you by the state of Idaho. Before doing that, I'll explain what will happen at this hearing and then advise you of your constitutional rights and plea options. If at any time you need to talk to your attorneys in confidence, please advise the court or them. They'll notify me and we can arrange for you to have a discussion with them off the record and in confidence if you request that. This case uh, began with the filing of an indictment that was issued by a grand jury on May 25th, 2021. That indictment sets forth the criminal charges the state's filed against you. The indictment is not evidence, rather it lists the criminal charges that will be prosecuted by the state of Idaho. Mr. Archibald, have you received a copy of the indictment and reviewed that with your client? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. In a moment then, uh, Mrs. Daybell, I'll advise you of the charges pending against you and explain the penalties associated with those charges. Uh, Mrs. Daybell, the purpose of an arraignment is to have you enter a plea to the charges contained in that information. Therefore, at the end of the arraignment, I'll ask you how you, you intend to plea. In that regard, you would have three options. Your first option is that you may enter a plea of not guilty. If you elect to plead not guilty, a jury trial and a pretrial conference will be scheduled in your case. Also, by pleading not guilty, you will maintain all of your constitutional rights in this case. And those rights were previously explained to you on May 26, 2021 at your initial appearance before the magistrate. I'll note that on that date uh, in the record of the case is a form entitled the notification of rights that you had signed and initial. Do you recall receiving that form and signing it? Very well. Among those rights, and I'll go back through several of those, you do have the right to be presumed innocent in this case. The presumption of innocence is a real and important right which lies at the foundation of our criminal justice system. Therefore, unless you either plead guilty at a later date or the state proves the charges against you beyond a reasonable doubt at trial, the presumption of innocence remains in your case. You also have the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of your peers, as well as the right to see, hear, confront, and have your attorney question all witnesses who may be called to testify against you. 
During the pendency of your case and at trial, you also have the right to be represented by an attorney. As you are in custody, you have the right to communicate with your attorney at all stages of your case and reasonable access to communication with your attorneys will be provided. At your trial, you will have the right to present evidence in your defense and the right to subpoena power of the court to compel the attendance of witnesses to testify on your behalf. Finally, if you plead not guilty, you will retain the right to remain silent and exercise the privilege against compulsory self-incrimination. This means that you cannot be required to testify against yourself. However, you may voluntarily take the witness stand if you so choose, but you cannot be compelled to do so. If you decide not to testify on your own behalf, the prosecuting attorney can make no remarks about your failure to testify and cannot imply to the jury that exercising your constitutional right to remain silent is any indication of your guilt. Your next option and second would be to stand silent and enter no plea at all. If you decide to do that, the court would enter a plea of not guilty for you and you would continue to maintain all of the rights I just explained to you. Your third option is that you may plead guilty to any or all of the charges. However, it's important that you understand if you were to plead guilty, you would automatically waive rights, including rights under the fourth, fifth and sixth amendments to the Constitution, as well as similar rights contained in the Idaho Constitution. If you were to enter a guilty plea, then I would go through in more detail those rights you'd be waiving before that time. If I was advised, that's how you intended to plead today. It's very important that you understand all of these rights and options that I just explained to you. And so before I go further with your arraignment, do you have any questions regarding what I've just explained for me or anything you want to ask your attorney? Very well. Mrs. Dabell, and you're brought before this court to answer for the indictment that was filed in this case, which is, alleges that you have committed serious crimes in that six felony charges have been filed in the grand jury's indictment. Before I allow you to respond by entering a plea to the charges in the indictment, I'll ask you a few questions. First of all, did you have any questions about your right and plea options in this case? All right, and have you seen a copy of that indictment and had it provided to you? And have you had enough time to review that indictment with your attorneys? Very well. At this time, I will review the charges contained in the indictment and the possible penalties for those charges. The indictment charges under count one, the charge of conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception felony charges under Idaho Code 18-1701, 18-4003A, 18-24031, 18-24034A, and 18-24071B3. Your Honor. Yes. We waive the reading if, if a summary is acceptable. Very well. Mr. Archibald, if you read that, I'm fine with that. So that is the count contained in the charge is contained in count one, and that relates to a, a allegation of a conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree of Tylee Ryan and to commit grand theft by deception. I'll advise you, Mrs. Daybell, that the possible penalties associated with those charges are the conspiracy to commit first degree murder is punishable by death or imprisonment by life, imprisonment for life. And if the death penalty is not sought, a mandatory life sentence with a minimum period of confinement being 10 years, that's the possible penalty on the conspiracy to commit first degree murder charge. You understand that charge and the possible penalty there? Yes. Very well, the second part of that count is grand theft by deception. That's a felony that's punishable by a fine not exceeding $5,000 or by imprisonment in the state prison for not less than one year or more than 14 years and which may also contain a restitution requirement. You understand that charge of felony grand theft? Yes. All right, the next count of the indictment alleges a charge of first degree murder and that is in relation to Tylee Ryan. That charge of first degree murder carries again the penalty of being punishable by death or imprisonment for life and if the death penalty is not sought, a mandatory life sentence with minimum period of confinement being 10 years. Do you understand the charge and the possible penalties in count two of the indictment? Yes. Okay. 
Count three is a charge of conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. That is an allegation relating to an alleged murder in the first degree of Joshua Jackson Vallow, here and after referred to as J.J. Vallow. Again, that conspiracy to commit first degree murder, I've already indicated what the penalty is. It's the same as in the prior count. Do you have any questions about that charge or the possible penalty? Very well, the next part is grand theft by deception. And again, that is punishable by a fine not exceeding $5,000 and imprisonment in the state prison, not less than one year, no more than 14 years, and may contain a restitution requirement. Do you understand that part of count three as it relates to the charge of grand theft? All right, the next count relating to you in the indictment is count four of the indictment, which is a count of first degree murder as it relates to J.J. Vallow under that count. Again, the charge is punishable by death or imprisonment for life, and if the death penalty is not sought, a mandatory life sentence with a minimum period of confinement being 10 years. Do you understand the charge of count four and the possible penalties? Very well. Count five, then, is the next count alleged in the indictment relating to you. Count five is conspiracy to commit first degree murder. That is in relation to Tamara Tammy Daybell. The conspiracy to commit first degree murder charge in that count, again, carries a penalty of it may be punishable by death or imprisonment for life. And if the death penalty is not sought, a mandatory life sentence with a minimum period of confinement of at least 10 years. Do you understand the charge contained in count five and the possible penalties? All right, finally, I believe the last count in the indictment uh, filed against you is count seven. That is a count of grand theft. Grand theft is a felony in Idaho that's punishable, again, by a fine not exceeding $5,000 by imprisonment in the state prison, not less than one year, no more than 14 years, or and also may contain a restitution requirement. So do you understand the charge filed in count seven and the possible penalties? Very well. That summarizes then the charges contained in the indictment. At this time then I'm going to go back through the charges and ask how you plead as to each charge. Before I take that plea then, do you have any questions for the court or anything you need to discuss with your attorneys? Your Honor, she intends to remain silent. I'll ask the court to enter and not guilty pleas for her and set the matter for trial. Very well, Mr. Archibald. Then that is her right to remain silent. The court, upon entry of that, will enter a not guilty plea as it relates to all of the counts alleged in the indictment against the defendant. That is on count one. A not guilty plea will be entered on count two. A not guilty plea is entered on count three. A not guilty plea is to be entered on count four. The not guilty plea will be entered and on count five and on count seven. Having entered those not guilty pleas then, Mr. Archibald, we'd like to discuss the setting of trial in this case. As I'm sure you're aware, there's a companion case that is already scheduled for a trial to start on January 9th. The court's made some previous rulings that apply to this case and were set in that case as well, indicating that these cases would be tried in a joint trial. In order to have your client uh, appear for that trial date, that would require her to go outside of the time frame for speedy trial. Have you discussed with your client her speedy trial rights and whether she intends to waive those to uh, have the trial as now set, or, or what's your plan on the trial setting? Yes, Your Honor, we have discussed it. Uh, she does not intend to waive her right to a speedy trial. All right, I'll note that the defendant's in custody. There is a statutory requirement under Idaho Code 1930-501, subsection 1, which does require that the matter be set for trial within six months if speedy trial is not waived. Uh, that would give a deadline of approximately October 19th 
for the trial to commence in this case. Council, with that in mind, in a prior trial setting already slated in the companion case for January, uh, I'm going to consult with Council and discuss the setting of a trial in this case, um, making sure we can all confirm with our calendars when that can take place. I'll ask the state at this time, Ms. Blake, there's been a request in the other companion case for a trial of a duration of 10 weeks. And if this uh, matters to go forward with both defendants now, is the 10 week trial setting that has previously been scheduled uh, sufficient time to have the case tried? Yes, Your Honor. The state would be asking for 10 weeks. Okay. Uh, Mr. Archibald, having consulted with your client, reviewed the evidence, I think at this point, at least to some extent, as I'd note the case has been stayed, but you've been appointed for some time. Do you believe that that 10 week trial setting is a sufficient amount of time? Yes, Your Honor. All right. All right, well, with that in mind then, counsel, uh, I'm going to review calendaring and we'll get a trial set within the speedy time frame limits if your client's not gonna waive that right. Uh, so we'll look at a setting that would likely occur in, in mid-October for trial in this case. Uh, does the state have anything they want to add or be heard on in terms of the trial setting, Ms. Blake? Uh, Your Honor, I think uh, with the request to have the trial held within 180 days, it sounds like this court is going to look at the court's calendar. I think the state's um, thought process would be we'll look at our calendar as well. Right now, there is a court order indicating these matters will be tried together, um, and there had been a severance motion which was denied in the companion case at this point. Um, but we will look at the state's calendar and request the opportunity to provide briefing to the court if the court um, would allow that with regard to whether or not a separate trial should be set. Okay, we will take that under advisement. It's a decision that obviously needs to be set uh, quickly, the trial setting with a limited time frame for us to make these arrangements for trial. Uh, and so I will contact counsel about calendaring, which we can do off the record and confirm dates for the commencement of a trial. Um, uh, the presumption the, being at this time that it would be a single trial together with both this case and the companion case of uh, State versus Chad Guy Daybell, case CR 22-21-16-23. Um, to be tried together, but uh, if the state believes that's not the case based on the previous rulings, I'll consider that. However, uh, we'll set out a scheduling order and I'll advise counsel that we'll need to have these dates sorted out by the end of this week because I'd like to get the matter on the calendar uh, so that we can start making arrangements for trial. And Your Honor, if I may just clarify, it is the state's belief that they are uh, to be tried together. I think when I was referring to the briefing, it was if we were going to, for any reason, set a separate trial date um, sooner than that January date, then we just request an opportunity to brief that issue. But it is the state's belief these are one matter for trial, just to clarify that. Okay, <clears throat> understood. And also given the nature of that proceedings here, I think we have to have Mr. Pryor's input as well as potentially this will affect his currently scheduled case for trial. So that will, I believe conclude what we need to cover today on the hearing for the arraignment and I'll get together with counsel to determine trial dates and then we'll get a scheduling order out once that's been confirmed. Mr. Archibald, is there anything else we need to bring up for the defense today? No, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Blake, anything further for the state? Your Honor, I think the only other thing the state had to mention today was the state has filed a motion for a joint status conference in the two case numbers. It sounds like we may be having one anyway when we're talking about setting trial dates, uh, so there may be no need to address that. We were just going to request a date be set on that matter since the council was here. Okay, I'll reach out to council and see if we can cover those issues you wanted to cover in a status conference when we do our scheduling. And uh, with that in mind then, that will conclude the Hearing today, I appreciate the uh, everyone's complying with the court's order as it relates to uh, maintaining demeanor in the courtroom this afternoon, and we'll be in recess. All rise. <laughs>